we were talking. The Book of Mormon tells us, as you know, for whom the bell tolls. Le Lehi and his great contemporaries uh, started a lot of chain reactions. We don't mention them because they were interesting curiosities or anything like that, but because we're still living on their on their capital. Why did I put Thales on the board, for example? He raised the question of science and religion. First, on a sci really scientific basis, and it's never been settled, the arguments have always been the same ever since on both sides. Remember Thales predicted, uh, predicted the eclipse in 858, and his mother was a Phoenician. He's supposed to be in the family of Cadmus, they migrated and settled Thebes. This is in prehistoric times. But you know, Cadmus is the person who's supposed to have brought the phonetic alphabet to Greece. The Greek alphabet's derived from the phonetic alphabet, uh, the Phoenician alphabet, phonetic indeed, it was. Uh, from the Phoenician alphabet, the name Cadmus means the man of the East, Kedem. You see the man of the East in Hebrew, Arabic, anything like that. He's the man who comes from the East with the wisdom of Kedem. But a descendant of his was Thales, and uh, they moved to Miletus, and he's the first of the Miletians. Who, he is called the first philosopher, the first person who actually thought by himself entirely, ruling everything else out. And this is very important because, well, the Miletian school which he began, Miletus, uh, a colony, well, the last Heraclitus was he, it was Ephesus, a nearby city. These were the cities of Asia Minor, settled by people who'd been uprooted, who'd left the graves of their fathers and their old cultures and more or less cracked up. And they were engaged, as we saw, in mercenary works and in trade and in also in philosophy and thinking for themselves. So the Miletian school starts out on the basis of there is a God, but we can't use him in our calculations. We can't bring him into the laboratory. We can't uh, weigh or measure anything about him. And uh, so let's see how far we can get without him. Let's see how. And so they, they became the first physicists, the physicists. They first studied the physicists. The physicist, of course, is the physical, the tangible cosmos, the order of things in the physicist. So they became the first physicists. They were the physical scientists, and this was their argument, of course, that you don't, that you don't need God for your calculations. In fact, he will, he will spoil things. This is what wrecks all theological arguments. All you have to do is say God did it, and you don't have any argument left. You know, anything is possible with God. There's no argument after that, and it's absurd to go on arguing about it, though they do all the time. Uh, and it's the way to end. As I say, any any argument, you bring God into the picture, he is infinite, he's everywhere, he's indescribable. Uh, you can't you can't say anything about him without insulting him, because you're so, he's so far from your comprehension, and yet he can do anything. And any time you want to explain anything, you just say God. Well, these people didn't find that satisfying. They say, well, we can assume that God exists, let that go. But let's see how far we can go with our own experiments in weighing and measuring. So they became physicists. And... As they soon discover, if God is unnecessary in your calculations, he soon becomes a nuisance if you start bringing him in. If he's a nuisance, he becomes an obstacle. And it becomes a pernicious element. They resent him, and before you know it, they begin to preach actively against him. We've had, we mentioned before, we've had uh, very eminent scientists come here as evangelists, preaching nothing else but uh, against God. Uh, well, Alfred Kazan, yesterday, I think he, he's talked to students about that, at least I read about it, that we live in a a uh, generation decides they could get on, get along without God, and now it leaves them in a rather, rather tragic situation. Of course, this was the same with the Greeks, too. See, they didn't rule it out, but uh, once you start saying, well, we can get along without him, well, Laplace, when, when uh, Napoleon asked him about God, you remember he was the, the one who invented the, the spiral nebula origin of the universe, uh, Laplace, when Napoleon asked him, he says, Monsieur, je n'ai pas besoin de ce... De cette hypothèse. I have no need for that hypothesis. He says, he doesn't need God in his works. I have no need for that hypothesis. Whether he exists or not is none of my business. You say, we don't deal with the, with the big questions. Well, scientists are back to the big questions again. But see, this raised the issue, and the issue naturally became this. All right, when you're talking about God and so forth, how does everything begin? Now, this relates to the Book of Mormon, isn't it? It does. Uh, how does everything begin? That's the first thing. What about the cosmology, its organization, what it's made of, and why it operates, and what makes it go? And so for this became the first thing. So they're looking for a first principle. 
of Prima Mobilum, something like that, and <coughs> Thales looked for it and discovered it was water. Now you notice it's exactly the same thing that the quantum physicists are doing today. They're looking for something smaller than quarks, which were something smaller than atoms and so forth. Something, some single element which will be responsible for everything. Some single particle. It's that particle that we're after. That's the whole thing. And that's exactly what they were looking for. The process is still going on. They used whatever evidence they had. They used ingenious experiments. Thales described, uh, decided that the basis, basic element was water. And his successor, Xenophanes, uh, well, uh, not Xenophanes, uh, Anaximenes, he was, an, uh, he was a, uh, an Athenian philosopher, a celebrated atheist, but Anaximander, it was the top here and the boundless, which is one worlds proceed out of each other and you don't ask how particularly, as the Arabs call it, the Belachai, never ask how. That's a good way of getting rid of an argument. See, when you say God does it, you say how, and then the Arab says that's a Belachai, that's a don't ask how. You just don't ask how. Because actually, as Einstein says, science does not explain. It only describes. You describe what happens, you haven't explained it. So go the next step and describe what happens. You still haven't explained it. We still haven't explained what that ultimate particle is. So he said it was, uh, well, then Anaximenes, followed by Anaximenes, who says it was air and has to do with condensation hot and cold, condensed, heavy and light, and so forth, but that there's a solid element, it's thinned out and it's extreme in air, and it depends on the degrees of condensation, what you get, how near you get to atoms. And then uh, later, you know, the, then Heraclitus says it's fire, which is a basic element, and so the cold and the fire. And later you get down to real atomists with the Democrates and, uh, and the Stoics, people like that. But anyway, Thales, is the point, was a real scientist. He raised the question that's never been settled yet. And this comes right down to our time. And it's the same thing with Solon. Now, Solon's in direct line. We must not forget that the founding fathers, uh, they read their Cicero and their Plutarch, and they knew all about Solon, and they embodied the uh, and Diodorus and so forth, and the famous speeches we get uh, from uh, Thucydides and like. And they knew those speeches. And they knew the arguments about democracy, which Solon began. He started them as the first great, uh, the father of modern democracy. And they used them as their guide for producing the Constitution. The con these, these men were constitutionalists. I, <coughs> for four years at Claremont College, I taught a course alternately with Everett Dean Martin. He would teach on Tuesdays and on Thursdays, and we taught absolutely opposite points of view. But he was, uh, he was a founder. Of, uh, stu uh, of Cooper Union in New York, and he was a great uh, student of the Constitution, and this was his main theme, the great influence of the classical writers on the authors of the Constitution. So Solon comes right down to us. He was the first and greatest of the administrators. So we, as we say, we call a senator, his, it's easy to spell out in the headlines, uh, a Solon, which of course is not without irony. Well, we proceed, but we were showing that uh, Solon was more uh, the rational politician, he saw the religious foundations of things and what the real trouble was and where the enemy was on a famous elegy of his. He says, the ruin of our state will never come by the doom of Zeus or through the will of the blessed immortal gods. Who is the enemy? Don't blame them. For Pallas Athena, Mag Magathemus, Obramapatres, Episcopus, he uses the word Episcopus. She's the Episcopal, she's the overseer, Athena. For a valiant daughter of a valiant sire, our stout-hearted guardian, he calls it that, holdeth over her protecting arms. We're all right as far as heaven is concerned. It is the townsfolk themselves and their false-hearted leaders who would fain destroy our great city through wantonness and love of money. And we get back to the fundamentals we're starting right out here. And right, Book of Mormon, of course, setting their hearts on riches. But they are destined to suffer sorely for their outrageous behavior. They know not how to hold in check their full-fled lust, nor content with the merriment of the banquet of merriment of the banquet affords to take their pleasure soberly and in order. There are things we have should enjoy. We should have uh, should enjoy life and so forth. But you never can hold yourself back. These people don't. They are rich because they yield to the temptations of dishonest courses. They spare neither the treasures of the gods nor the property of the state and steal like brigands from one another. Heavens, I have a pile of clippings that high from the Wall Street Journal showing what the shenanigans that go on in high places today. And this is absolutely true. They steal, they uh, spare neither the treasures of the gods or the property of the state and steal like brigands from one another. Brigands from another. They pay no heed to the unshaken rock of holy justice. Now this comes out in the Book of Mormon, this passage, and it's quoted, it's practically a quote from Jeremiah. Remember, well, we'll return to Jeremiah in a minute. They, and uh, who, though she be silent, is aware of all that happeneth now 
or hath happened in the past, and in the course of time surely cometh to demand retribution. The, the rock of holy justice, and the rock is referred to in, in the book of Moses in the same way by Enoch, uh, and uh, the rock, we talk about the rock of our salvation and so forth. The rock is any firm any firm uh, foothold that you can get for a thing, and of course the rock here is justice, is do that doing that which is right. Lo, even now there cometh upon the, the whole city a plague which none may escape. The people have come quickly into degrading bondage. Bondage rouseth from their sleep war and civil strife. The war destroyeth many in the beauty of their youth. It's as if we were prey of a foreign foe. Our beloved city is rapidly wasted and consumed in those secret combinations, right out of the Book of Mormon, you see, which are the delight of dishonest men. Again, you see, uh, where is the enemy and so forth? Not those wicked Lamanites. These are the evils which stalk at home. Meanwhile, the poor and needy in great numbers are loaded with shameful bonds and sold into slavery for foreign lands because they couldn't meet it on their small farms. You see, they, they were being taken over by big landowners. As Isaiah says, adding field to field. I mean, you can match every verse of this, of course, by Isaiah, who lived before this, but Jeremiah is contemporary and Lehi is contemporary. This man, remember, year 600 is a, the center of his career, just like it's the, the peak of Lehi's career. Thus, the public calamity comes to the house of every individual, and a man is no longer safe in the gates of his own court. This is going to hunt you down. You think crime? Well, I can put myself behind gates and so forth. I recently visited in Southern California, not recently, it was a couple of years ago now, a very high official who was also a member of the church. He couldn't get into his own house without presenting a special card at the electrified gate opener, electronic gate opener. The place was patrolled by Doberman pinchers and by searchlights, and he had to have bodyguards all the time just because he'd been so very, very successful. Well, that's a way to live in a prison, isn't it, as far as that goes? <laughs> but uh, thus public calamity come on every individual, and a man is no longer safe within the gates of his own court, which refuse him their protection. It leapeth over the garden wall, however high it be, and surely findeth him out, though he run and hide himself in the inmost corner of his chamber. Again, we're, this is the language of the prophets of Israel. I mean, they use these very same terms, these very same images and so forth. And, but it's literally true. It, it'll trace you. You can't get away from it. it. Well, of course, it's also prime time TV, you know, where, where we're taken to the boudoirs of the mighty and so forth and see the shenanigans that go on there, usually ending in somebody getting shot. Well, these things my heart prompteth me to teach the Athenians. This is his revelation, you see. My heart prompteth me to teach the Athenians to make them understand that lawlessness worketh more harm to the state than any other cause, but a law-abiding spirit createth order and harmony, and at the same time putteth chains upon evil doers. He finishes under the law of reign of law, sanity and wisdom prevail ever among men. And here is the principle, he says. This is the fullness of time, the ripeness when the cup is full, when the fruit is ripe. In the, the, in the promised land, the promise is given, it's standing all the time. The people will be swept from the land. They will not just hang around. They will be swept from the land when the time is fully ripe, <clears throat> when their cup of iniquity is full. But the Lord will wait till then. As he says here, Out of the cloud cometh snow and hail in their fury, and a thunderbolt springeth from the lightning flash. So from great men, he's talking about Pisistratus, who had been the tyrant of Athens. He was a great and capable man, but this is what they'll always bring. He says, so from great men, ruin issueth upon the state, and people through their own folly sink into slavery under a single lord. Having raised a man too high, it is not easier to hold him now. Mosiah 29 gives a long sermon to his sons on this subject. Uh, the, the, his people, rather, his sons refuse to become kings. He says, if you make a man king, you can't replace him. Remember the case of King Noah. It's going to be awfully tough. And as he says here, having raised a man too high, uh, to too high a place, it is not easy later to hold him back. Now is the time to be observant of all these things. If ye have suffered the melancholy consequences of your own incompetence, do not attribute this evil fortune to the gods. You have yourselves raised up these men to power over you, and have reduced yourself by this course to a wretched state of servitude. Each man among you individually, this is the way it goes, this is your free enterprise, you see. Each man among you individually walketh with the tread of a fox, but collectively you are a set of simpletons. You don't act together at all, but for yourself you're all out to get it. For you lick, and this is the fatal thing, of course, if you're acting as a rhetoric is the secret of the whole thing. We get it in, in the Book of Mormon too, you see. For you look to the tongue and play of a man's speech, and regard not the deed which is done before your eyes, you see. 
the skillful rhetoric, the skillful speech, which reminds us that the, uh, the Book of Mormon has characters that are eminently concerned with this uh, philosoph philosophical rationalism and atheism, such as Nehor and Korihor, who are also men of great ambition, great... There's a whole string of them in the Book of Mormon, very skillful in speech, who do the same sort of thing, and uh, the people look to the tongue and play of a man's speech remember he was skillful in many words we're told and he led all the people out and they just loved him and so King Noah was extremely popular that way for he looked at the tongue and play of a man's speech and regard not the deed which is done before your eyes well he goes on here <coughs> and then but what about the religion this man has had experience and this is a theme you get in all the Greek tragedies and everywhere else and remember the Book of Mormon is a tragic book it, it it's a voice from the dust and it's very sad, as you know. It begins on a note of destruction. It ends on a note of destruction. It begins to, with, a, with lone survivals in the wilderness and ends with a lone survival. Nothing more sad than survivor. Survival is a dirty word. Thus, all men of mortal mold, mold good and like and bad, think by straining every nerve to win a fair name, each man for himself by his own unaided efforts, until something befall him from without, then straightway cometh pain. Until then, like gaping fools, we assume ourselves, amuse ourselves with empty dreams. Who is warned by cruel, this is the American dream too, I can give you many cases, he who is warned by cruel disease pondereth how one day he will be whole. Our constant preoccupation, of course, with medicine and cures, miracle and otherwise. Another who is a coward thinketh himself brave, Another still counteth himself handsome, though he have no beauty of body. If one be penniless and subject to the toils of poverty, he assureth himself that he will someday win great riches. It is a marvelous speech from Timon of Athens, speaking of this by Shakespeare, which he talks about what money can do when Timon finds the treasury. He says, this much of this will make black, white, base, noble, wrong, right, co coward, valiant, young, old, why this, you gods? Why this? The money will do that. You see, you can, it will give you the answer. If you're, if you're a coward or if you're miserable, if you're base, it will, it will exalt you and so forth. This it is that makes the wapened widow wed again. She can wed no matter what if she has it. Uh, and this again uh, gives uh, thieves honor, knee, and approbation with senators on the bench. A person can buy himself a place in politics and he'll be honored with all of that. He goes on this long speech. I could recite it for you if it was in the mood. But... Uh, but this is the theme, you see. This is, and notice Shakespeare places his, his uh, puts his play in Athens. This is what happened. You see, time of Athens. This is a true story. You see, time of Athens, true story. It really happened to, uh, to what's his name? Uh, think of it. Uh, time of Athens. Uh, he was very rich. He inherited this great fortune. But he was also very generous. He entertained everybody. He paid anybody's debts. He, uh, he'd loan anybody anything they wanted. And then doing that, he ran out of funds and became uh, impoverished. And he went around to his friends and tried to collect. Shakespeare knows how people are, and he couldn't collect anywhere. Everybody had a good excuse and so forth and felt sorrow. They cut him dead in the streets because he didn't have money anymore and so forth. So he becomes a recluse, and he goes out in the woods and lives on roots. And then he says, Earth, give me roots. Uh, who, he who asks better of thee that sauce his palate with thy most inoperate poison. What have we here? Gold, precious. And he digs up a treasure. Uh, it was Herodotus Atticus, who was the person who did it. And he actually did. On the, he went out in the woods to dig himself a grave. He was going to commit suicide because he'd lost his wealth. He had no recognition, whatever. As he started digging, he tr tr struck a treasure, a fabulous treasure. Get all mixed up here. He struck this fabulous treasure, which made him enormously rich. He, took, he went to the Emperor Nerva and said, look, what can I do with this treasure? This is, I can't use all this. And then the good Emperor Nerva, Nerva says, well, if you can't use it, abuse it. It's yours, he said. No, he didn't abuse it. No, he gave the, the theater of Herodotus, uh, Herodotus Atticus to the Athenians. It's still there. That's the one where they still put on Greek plays from way back in the, in the first century there. It's a beautiful theater. I've, I've seen some of Aristophanes produced there. Uh, and, and that was the theater of Herodotus Atticus. But he, he found his money, and but uh, he, he found that uh, it was uh, people would do anything for it and will do nothing for it without it. This is the point. And this is the theme with him here. The, uh, then, where's he going? No, here's an example. This is, this is the trouble, he says. No visible limit is, is set to wealth among men. 
even now. Do you know who the richest family in America is? Did you see that in the paper the other day? Oh, I cut this out too. It's too good to be true. <laughs> it's a marvelous comment on our sense of values, of things that we consider real worth. Who is, what is the richest family in America worth nine billion dollars approximately? That's a lot of dough, you see. Nine thousand million. The people who make M&Ms. That's where they made their fortune, on M&Ms. They melt in your mouth, not in your hand. Nine billion dollars, please. <laughs> That's what we really pay for in our society, the things that really count. Well, even now, those among us who have the largest fortune are striving with redoubled energy. What abundance of riches could satisfy us all? Increase of goods cometh to mortals by gift to the gods. But out of it appeareth madness. This is the process again, the four steps of the cycle, you see. The chorus, and the albus, the chorus, the hybris, and the eighty. Yes? Oh, this is, uh, it's not in the library. This is by Professor Linforth, uh, from whom I say I had, he was an eminent hymnalist. I had a number of, to do some name dropping. I had quite a number of seminars from him, in, including Greek, uh, let me see some orators, Greek composition, yes, from him. And he, he wrote this, it's called Saul and the Athenian. <laughs> so he says, but, uh, but with it, with the increase of goods, appeareth madness which leadeth to destruction. And when Zeus sendeth his madness as punishment to men, it lighteth first upon one and then upon another. And then here is the typical Greek statement, right out of the Greek tragedy, uh, where we say something like, uh, it's, as, as Sophocles say, Oginus anthropon, osas isus kaito me then, and arithmo. O human race, how I calculate you to be equal to exactly nothing, he says. And, and that's what he says here. Perfect bliss, a state of mind denied to mortal men. Wretched are they, are all they upon whom the sun looks down. That's what we learn. You see, nobody is completely happy in this life. A la poneroi pantes hosus netus e elios cathara. Miserable poneroi. He says, wretched, good's a good word, you see, are all those upon whom the sun looks down. Well, where does religion come in here and how does it help him? Well, he, uh, his, his personal life and so forth, uh, oh, these are other things. We, I think of the beginning, with what we have from his most famous line, well, we mentioned that before. Well, let's go on to somebody that's going to tell the same story exactly, but should be required reading for anyone who intends to study the Book of Mormon. This is absolute. If we put no one, nothing else on the reading list, this is number one, two, three, four, and five, and of course it's Jeremiah. If you read in First Nephi 7 and 14, Jeremiah could only have been a close personal friend of Lehi. He says here, uh, they've driven him out, let's see 714 here. where he mentions him personally. For behold, the Spirit of the Lord ceaseth soon to strive with them. For behold, they have rejected the prophets. And Jeremiah have they cast into prison. Now this is contemporary. See, it's Nephi speaking to his people. And they have sought to take away the life of my father insomuch that they have driven him from out of the land. So they, put, they imprisoned Jeremiah and they drove Lehi out of the land who belonged to the party of Jeremiah. Now we have very good contemporary sources which we'll soon mention here, that, that put us right into the scene here. Discovered between 1935 and 38. Yes, the... Uh, he had... No one believed him, as you see from the book of Jeremiah. No one believed him. And they didn't want to believe him. They knew he was right, as he says, but they didn't want to believe him. So he had no large following at all, but he had some who were faithful to him, including prophets in the, in the city and in the country. So, a faithful man. And one of those was certainly Lehi. And Lehi, being a very influential man and being of the party of Jeremiah, would naturally know Jeremiah. They're strictly contemporary. He's in the city. And he's going to tell us about the situation in Jerusalem here. So we'll use the King James, which is a great literary masterpiece, and we'll find good old uh, Jeremiah here. There we are. I'm going. To, well, I'll read you off the passages I quote. So put, write down Jeremiah and then write chapter and verse. This will save you trouble if you want representative passages from Jeremiah. And this will tell us what the situation is at Jerusalem. Now you've just heard from Solon, there's a lot more we could put in here, what the situation was in Athens. But uh, 
Incidentally, I think the, the book of the library is making a, uh, a Xerox of this, and I'll, I'll put it on the on reserve when they do. As I say, they don't have this. This is my own. I got it from Professor Linfitz, so it's a rare book. Well, now here he is, at chapter 5, verse 25. He begins summarizing the situation at Jerusalem. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. You could have had good things, but your own sins have kept you from having. The Lord wants you to have good things. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that setteth snares, they set a trap that they catch men. Well, this is what sales strategies are for, what public relations for, what hype is for, to trap people. We, gave, we have given courses here called Strategies of Salesmanship. Well, strategy is defined in the dictionary as deceit, uh, deception practiced on an enemy. That's what it is, you see. Well, it's, that's exactly what it is. And you win wars by strategy, by making them, not, making them think you are where you are not, making them think you what your intentions are, what your strength is. You fool them every way you possibly can. And that is the soul of strategy, because surprise is what you want to achieve. You, you want him to move in one direction while you're really moving in another. So strategy and tactics... Strategy wins war, tactics wins battles. He does the same thing, but the idea is trickery all the way through. That's what you're supposed to do. A good general, he saves himself lives and everything else if he just can boob the enemy and surprise him completely. So, for among my people, yes, the ca a ca as a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Notice the emphasis is all on deceit. Saying things you don't mean. You can't re rely on anybody. Nobody keeps his word anymore. Therefore, they are, therefore they are become great and waxen rich. Through deception. This is, this is the secret of getting rich, you see. They are waxen fat, they shine. The Hebrew word there, shemen, is to be fat and, go, and, and gleaming, glossy, fat and sassy, uh, <laughs> running fat. Shemen, of course, is the, the very essence of prosperity, and it's just the word for fat. Uh, Therefore, they have become great, yes. Now, waxen fat, they shine, yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy they do not judge. They don't take his part. Shall I not visit these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. They want to hear good things. Of course, Samuel the Lamanite is the classic in the Book of Mormon. A person comes to Zarahemla telling you what's wrong with Zarahemla, and you say he's a false prophet and try to put him to death. A person comes and tells you what's right with Zerahim, he says you lift him up on your shoulders, you dress him in fine apparel, and you claim he is a, uh, a true prophet, and you become his followers, and so forth. You just want to hear what's right with the country, not what's wrong with it. And he says, the prophets prophesy falsely, and their priests bear rule by their, by their means, and my people love to have it that way. And what will you do in the end, Zerah? What's going to happen if this is the way it is? Let's turn the... The next chapter tells what's going to happen to them. Notice what brings this on. The cause of this is not these wicked people from the north at all he's talking about. You are the cause of it. But he says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay, ho they shall lay hold on the bow and spear. They are cruel. They have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea. They ride upon horses. This is Babylonia. See, the Assyrians had already swept through their preceding generation. Set in array as men of war against the old daughters of Zion. And then he starts. The seventh chapter and the fourth verse. We begin here. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, this is where we have a reference. This is the true church. We have the gospel and so forth. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, the temple, the temple, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, we have the temple, you see. That will make us safe. He says, don't trust in that. It's repeated three times in the fourth verse here. For if ye thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if ye thoroughly execute judgment between man and his neighbor, this is what they were not doing, you see, if ye oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods in your heart. Notice walking after other gods comes last in the list. Of course, it's a bad one. The other gods are Egyptian. Then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in this land that I gave your fathers forever and ever. Behold, but behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, swear falsely, and burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in my house, he says, and come to the temple then in that condition, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? 
In this house which is called my name has become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. Remember, and this is what Christ, what the Lord, when he drives the thieves out, my father's house has become a den of thieves. He's quoting Jeremiah here, he says. Come to this house which is called by my name has it become a den of robbers. I will cast you out of my sight. I will cast all your brethren out, the whole seed of Ephraim. And this is what they're doing. You see a very interesting picture, the, how strongly the Egyptian culture is in the city. It's referred to later on more fully, but he says, you, you get the picture, the children gather wood and the fathers kindle a fire and the women knead their dough to make ca cakes to the queen of heaven. That's Isis. Yes, it's that the Egyptian mother goddess, Isis. And to pour drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. The ties with Egypt were very close. They had been for generations. And here's what's been going on. He tells in the 25th verse here, the same 7th chapter. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their necks. They did worse than their fathers. Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken to thee. Now he's commanded to preach to them. The Lord says, I know they won't listen to you, but you're going out to preach to them. I sent my prophets before, and they didn't listen to them. I knew they wouldn't listen to them. Well, you say, why do you bother to do these things? Well, remember when the Lord comes, they say, eh, now they have both seen and hated both me and the Father. If I had not testified to them, uh, then they would not be guilty, he says. But now they have to be responsible for refusing. They had the chance, you see. He says, this was so. Well, when they, he asked them, first of all, they say, he has the devil. And he says, this is in John. The Lord says, well, what have I done that's wrong. Which man convicteth me of evil? What did I do that was wrong? Then why don't you believe? He says, because your works are evil. And then, uh, he, and then he says, the uh, he says to them that they that the uh, did he's come to bear, and he sends the apostles out to preach the same way, uh, to bear witness to him. He says that they may be without excuse. That's the word he uses. This leaves them without excuse. You see, if we didn't send the prophets, then the people would have excuse. Well, we never had a chance. We never heard anything like that. He says, but I sent the prophets continually, and you paid no attention to them, so I'm continuing to send them too. This isn't fatalism or anything like that. The Lord knows they're not going to receive it, as far as this goes. Yet they hearken not unto you, nor incline there. Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken unto thee. Thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer thee. It's a futile mission he's on, but it's a very important mission. Even when we send missionaries out, you see, as far as that goes, we don't expect them to convert everybody. And then, in the ninth chapter, he wishes that he was out of it all. So this is the Rechabite principle. He's going to refer to Rechabites later on. This is the Rechabite principle. Get out of it, escape it, go to the desert, be by yourself. This happened from the very beginning. This is always happens in the Near East, where the desert begins right at the city wall. You can always get away from it. The only problem is how are you going to live once you're out there, you see. And so the, the hermits become men of extreme austerity of life, living, as John the Baptist did, on on uh, locusts and wild honey. And the locusts are real locusts. They really eat them, you know. They're, they're the big locusts, and they're, they're nourishing. They have protein in them. And he had the wild honey. This was John. Well, what else was there to eat, if you know what the Jordan is like? Oh, that I had a wilderness, a lodging place, said Jeremiah, a place of, of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them, for there shall be all adulterers, all assembly, all an assembly of treacherous men. And they bend their tongues like the bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Take heed every one of his neighbor, and he trust not... Everyone is beware, is the word is, is, is beware, is the word uh, they look for uh, from Ra. Take ye heed every man of his neighbor, and trust not in any, uh, in any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. Your brother, your neighbor, don't trust anybody. That's the principle. He says, you don't, so I've got to get out of here. He says, this is too much, can't take it. Well, you can't trust anybody anymore. What's the point of going on? And they will deceive everyone his neighbor, and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and weary themselves to commit iniquity. Thine habitation is the midst of deceit, though deceit, through deceit they refuse to know me. Notice it's deceit, deceit, lies and sighs. It's Madison Avenue right down the line, isn't it? <laughs> their tongue is as an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he layeth in wait. You see, you bring him on and so forth. No, this is what happens. Hmm. And this is, uh, well... Let's look at here at the first section of Doctrine and Covenants. The same thing here because he uses this expression there. The, uh, 
Well, remember Solon, where you couldn't escape it, it comes into your bedroom and so forth. Here he says the 21st verse in the ninth chapter. For death has come unto your windows, it has entered into your palaces to cut off the children from without and the young men from the streets. Into your windows and your palaces you can't shut it out. And he goes on, thus saith the Lord, let not, these are the three things men are after now. There are four things the Book of Mormon keeps telling us that everyone is after. Uh, Nephi, first Nephi says it, and the younger Nephi prophet says the very same thing. The four things everybody seek for in the Book of Mormon are wealth, power, popularity, and the lusts of the flesh. Plenty of sex. See, all the rest of it. Just, but those are the things. You want the power of the game. And after all, these are the basic fundamental plot of the big, of the shore selling, <laughs> of the shore selling uh, uh, TV prime time, as I say. The, and it isn't interesting how many, how many authors it took to produce that glorious plot and its glorious developments and ramifications. 9,200 writers struck in Southern California in this terrible strike. It took 9,200 geniuses to write these old repetitious threadbare <laughs> plots going on. on. And the industry ground to a halt when the 9,200 decide not to write any. I think two good writers could have handled it pretty well. No, but it had to be 9,200. <laughs> what commentaries on our culture we get here. This is Lehi's world, this is Jeremiah's, this is Solon's world. And th there are these very developed worlds when everything Notice relatively peaceful at the time, everything just cooking, the great tension between East and between Egypt, you see, between the, the Egypt and the East, in which, in the West rather, in which Israel is putting its trust, and in Babylon in the East, the great Asiatic power. <coughs> and thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, the clever guy, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches. And now what a change of tone, how suddenly everything cools off and becomes utterly delicious. What a contrast when he says, But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exerciseth loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Don't delight in those things. If you realize the Lord is there again, this takes us back to Mosiah 4 and 11. Just remember your own nothingness and the greatness and goodness of God, and then you will always rejoice. There's nothing to worry about. But this keeps everything churned up. If people are after the, the power and the gain and the celebrity, and then what you do, the, as he says, if you glory, glory in the Lord, who exercising loving kindness, Rahman Rahim, remember the opening passage of the, of the Quran, Alhamdulillah, Rahman Rahim, Malaka Yamadim, Iyaka Nakadu, he was telling me and so forth. He's Rahman Rahim. Rahman means gentle, Rahim means he's holding back. He has, a, he is la huwa ta'ala kawala ila Rahman Rahim. There is no power, there is no might except God. He has all the power and yet he doesn't use it. He holds back. He is loving kind, he withholds all the time. And this reflects itself in, in the, bloody, the, the, the bloody, absolutely murderous uh, disposition of so many Muslims against each other. Huh? And Christians just as bad. But this is what the Lord is, and this is the this is the world of Jeremiah. Let me see now. The uh, and then we can go on. Let's see. We get get some good ones here. And notice when they fast. Well, this is fourteen and twelve. This is the theme of all the prophets, especially Isaiah. But we're saying Isaiah is the most quoted prophet in the Book of Mormon. We don't need to quote him here, and he was the most quoted author in all subsequent Jewish history. They quote Isaiah all over the place. I mean, the Dead Sea Scrolls is practically built around Isaiah. And here, when they fast, I will not hear their cry. When they offer burnt offerings and oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by pestilence. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither... You now these are the false prophets. Neither shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. The prophets were full of happy talk, and the Lord says unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I didn't send them, neither have I commanded them. And he has to come up against these. And you can't overcome what's going to come on you, he says, by armaments and, uh, and by uh, strength. You're not going to get peace through strength, he says. Shall iron break the northern iron and the steel? Thy substance and thy treasures I will give to spoil without price, and that for all thy sins, even all in thy borders. Then he goes on here. Now he says, they're breaking the Sabbath. He says, in the 17th 
uh, chapter here, this is very important to, to keep the Sabbath here. 17th chapter, 21st verse, Thus saith the Lord, Take heed to yourselves, bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, neither carry forth a burden out of your... A thousand paces was the limit, you see. Uh, a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do ye any work, but hallow ye the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers, but they obeyed not. Neither inclined they their ear, but made their necks stiff, that they might not hear, nor receive instruction. So this is the theme. And then they said, come, let us devise devices against Jeremiah. He becomes the enemy of all the town, of course. He gets into real trouble, remember? Solomon said, I was like a wolf between two packs of dogs, surrounded by packs of dogs. Nobody wanted me, because I didn't say what either side wanted to hear. And he says, they said, come, let us devise devices against Jeremiah. Remember they said, Solomon is a fool. If I had had that power, I would give my skin to be flayed and uh, consent to the annihilation of my race and so forth. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor the counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, let us smite him, let us smite him with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. So he was cut off. He was a man alone, and so was Lehi. I remember he got into real trouble. He had to leave town if he was going to save his life at all. But thine eyes and thy heart are for naught but covetousness, and for shedding innocent blood, and for oppression, and for violence to do it. That's 22 and 17. Thus saith the Lord, execute ye judgment and righteousness, and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, and do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. If you do this thing indeed, then shall he enter in by the gates in his house, the king sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots on horses, in his servants, all be overthrown, you see. But thine eyes and thy heart are just for covetousness to the opposite of all these things. So the condition is clear. Uh, then uh, they say they dream dreams and so forth. He repeats that one again. And here, uh, now the chapter 25, incidentally, I was talking about the Egyptian, and Necho, the Pharaoh, and so forth. They're all in here. <coughs> Necho and Nebuchadnezzar and uh, Hophra, who was Apries. Apries was, uh, see, uh, Necho II wasn't killed at the Battle of Carchemish in 605. He withdrew to Egypt, and there he defended it, and the Babylonians weren't able to take Egypt. He did defend it against them. But he was followed by Pharaoh Hophra, who was Apries, who always kept promising hope to Jerusalem in Lehi's day, but he never gave it. He was a lackadaisical, and so he lost the city, and that's when it falls, of course. They're, but they put all their trust in, in Egypt, because they said Egypt has the money, Egypt has the power, and so forth, and uh, they had the navy, but it didn't save them because the king didn't act, and the, uh, he's talking about this. Jerusalem and the cities of Jerusalem, Pharaoh and the king of Egypt and his servants and all his people, and all the mingled people and all the kings of the land of Uz and all of the land of the Philistines, and Ashkelon and Azah, these are Phoenician setters too, and Azah and Ekron and a remnant of Ashdod, and Edom, that's way south in Arabia, and Moab, that is where Ammon is today, that's Jordan, and Moab, and the children of Ammon. See, it's very interesting that, uh, that the capital of Jordan is still, uh, 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 still Ammon, you see, and the city of Ammon, and the uh, Ammon, we call it, and that Ammon is by far the commonest name in the Book of Mormon, because Ammon is the god of the empire. His name was everywhere at this time. Remember, this is the great 26th dynasty, the great commercial empire and so forth. And Israel and Judah was right in the midst of it. And this long list of the things of Zimri and the kings of Elam, that's way back in Persia there, and all the kings of the Medes, way up in Central, Central Asia there, where that's the Medes, that's where Cyrus came from. <coughs> then they want to put him to death, and Jeremiah says, Know ye for certain, if you put me to death, you shall surely be shedding innocent blood. And then the princes and all the people said to the priests and to the prophets, This man is not worthy to die, for he has spoken us in the name of the Lord our God. It's the priests who wanted to go through with it, and, and this is important here. And uh, because this is the historical part that has been now supported so well by the Lakish letters, to which we'll, we'll have to refer to them the next time. Uh, this chapter uh, 26 is very good historically. It puts us into the local scene and the Book of Mormon scene as, uh, as Lehi describes. Lehi gives the most vivid description of all of the, the actual situation, the state of mind, everything else in Jerusalem at the time. This gives us the international affairs and it gives us the, the moral condition of the city and so forth. But it doesn't tell us about the tension, the particular parties, the differences in families and so forth that you find in the Book of Mormon. I spake also to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, saying, Bring your necks under the yoke of king of Babylon and serve him and you won't have any trouble. 
You'll be all right. You will. Why will you die and thy people by the sword and by famine? If you just knuckle under to Babylon, it'll be for 70 years and that'll be all right. Meantime, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. The prophets say that. They're just prophesying lies. See, it was the Egyptian party against the Babylonian party. And it came to pass the 28th, here's Book of Mormon here, and the 28th uh, chapter begins this way. Came to pass in the same year, in the beginning of the reign of King Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azar. Now, Hananiah is the false prophet, and he has a debate with Jeremiah. Hananiah is wrong, and Jeremiah is right, of course, but they won't listen to him. And he promises within two full years, this is what Hananiah promises. Hananiah is a good name for him. It means uh, uh, happy talk, happy man. Hana is to be healthy, to be happy, to be contented with everything. So Hananiah is, uh, she says, within two full years I will bring again to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babel, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. See, in 597, before, this is a long time before, Nebuchadnezzar had taken the city before. And he's taken this stuff to Babylon. He says, I'm go he's going to bring it back within two years. Well, instead of that, he comes... Now, this is in the first year of Zedekiah, but we're told here it was in the tenth year that the blow struck. And that gives, uh, that gives Lehi plenty of time to escape, you see. The, uh, and the prophet Jeremiah wouldn't go for that. And the prophet which prophesieth peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass. Now, this is the test. This is what Jeremiah says, all right. And Jeremiah says, that would be great. He says, I like what you say. It's very pleasing. I I'd think that was wonderful if it happened that way, he says. The prophet Jeremiah said, amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform thy words which thou hast prophesied to bring them again, the vessels of the Lord to the house, and all that car carried away captive from Babylon. Uh, he's not an evil wisher or anything like that, not a spiteful character. He just says that's, that's not the way it's going to be. It won't happen that way. What we'll have to do is just wait and see how it turns out. The prophet which prophesieth the peace when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly said it to him. So we'll know. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck. He was wearing a yoke to show that Israel and Judah would have to wear a yoke of the king of Babel. And so he broke the yoke off. He says, there's not going to be any yoke. And he broke it and he said, even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. He didn't fight about it, didn't argue about it, just have to wait and see how it turns out. The interesting thing is that he, he says, three cheers for Hananiah. I only hope you're right, but I know you're not, you see. And so... The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Go tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them a yoke of iron. Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee off from the face of the earth. This year shalt thou die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the people. And so Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. And it proves that Jeremiah, not Hananiah, was right. But you see, in making these decisions, uh, there's nothing rancorous about it. He says, this is what the Lord tells me to take. He's, we always get this picture of uh, the prophets of Israel as fierce old mullahs, uh, something like the Ayatollah, uh, showering sparks of hatred and fear, and uh, the, the great Satan. So there's none of that in it at all. He keeps saying, look, the Lord is gentle, he's kind, he wants to help you, he wants to do everything he can for you, and you won't do it. He says, Hananiah has given you a wonderful program, if you only behave yourself, yeah, that would be the way it would be, but I'm afraid that's not the way it's going to be. So this is the Jerusalem of, of uh, oh well, there's, there's a lot more, of course, there's 52 books. This is the longest book. Next to, is Isaiah longer? I think, uh, here's Isaiah here anyway, just a second. Isaiah, I think it's yeah, 66 chapters, and uh, Jeremiah is 52 chapters, the second longest book in the Bible. So you'll find your story in Jeremiah, what's going on here. But what you find in the Book of Mormon is not a rehash, or a paraphrase of Jeremiah at all. It's a much fuller picture of specifics that are going on, and you get a marvelous picture of what's happening. Well, we'll talk about that next time, and his getting out. See, our time is up now, and uh, we must go and hide in, in, in the rocks of the mountains, uh, in the cliffs. <laughs> Jeremiah did, you know, when he went to Babylon, he hid in a cave for a while then, and then he went back. He was a very important man. <laughs>